How come it's bright in this posh park but in Pollock it's dark? Probably because the sun isn't shining at everybody's ass. Welcome everyone to another edition of Red Lines TV. I'm delighted tonight to have a wee hero of mine, I've got to say, uh, and someone I'm really pleased to be able to have a chat with and to talk about is the insights that he shares across two publications, Poverty Safari and the Social Distance Between Us. But Darren McGarvey, who's also a broadcaster, poet, rapper, you name it, he'll do your shopping for you if you ask him nicely, I'm sure. Uh... But there's some some very contentious, uh, or I guess some of the life Dan would see your, your arguments as contentious, and I, I'm interested in uh, exploring, unpacking some of these. So across both books, you talk about um, a concept, an idea that you accuse the left of kind of recoiling from and being averse to addressing, and that is one of personal responsibility. You start off, I think it's fair to say, Dan, with a structural systemic critique of what ails us, but you do try uh, and, uh, in your words, uh, reclaim and redefine personal responsibility for the left. Can you maybe explain a wee bit more of, of how you see that? Yeah, certainly, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the, because the, the, the term personal responsibility itself is, is heavily loaded, because we do know that personal responsibility as it pertains to uh, the current economy and the current system uh, is, is really uh, invoking the images of Reagan and Thatcher and the entire neoliberal project which came to true manifestation during their political office. And this was a project that had been in long, long development on the margins of thought. It was it was lobbied, it was it was debated, it was think tanked for many, many, many decades. And then once uh, you know social democracies uh, during the post-war consensus had become a bit tired, had become a bit worn down, and the economies began to stagnate, and we've seen a lot of the, the problems that we see now high levels of inflation, geopolitical instability. Then this new neoliberal idea came in and central to that was personal responsibility. And this became a way for right-wingers to attribute failure to become financially successful to one's own character defects or one's own laziness. So I understand what the issue that people have on the left with this term personal responsibility is. My point is that I don't look at this necessarily as a political ideologue. I look at it as a writer, as someone who uses words and is interested in words. And so I see no reason really to change the terminology when we're talking about what, what, what we really mean, which is agency. And this is something that intellectuals and spiritualists and uh, theologians and, and philosophers have been discussing and debating for hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, this idea that at an individual level, dwelling within us is a particular experience, is a particular consciousness, and that by understanding that better, we can bring to bear on our circumstances more intentional faculties. We can un uncover the answers to certain problems that we might have thought were out with our competence. So the issue that they have is that they think that I'm, I'm playing some kind of right-wing shock jock or that I'm trying to uh, get into bed with Fraser Nelson uh, because I'm using this term, right? When the, the fact of the matter is I'm drawing from my own experience and the experience of many people that I've seen who grew up in harder circumstances than most people on the political left will ever understand. And part of the reason why they traverse those circumstances somewhat successfully is because they identified problems, contradictions within their own thinking and behaviour, and they began to iron them out. And there's a reason why people like Jordan Peterson resonate so heavily with uh, such a wide demographic. And we're not just talking about, you know, virgins living in their mother's basements uh, who are sexually abstinent through no choice of their own. We're talking about an intellectual who tours the world 
and as many women as men are going to see his lectures. And part of that is because he's delivering a message at the core, which is about agency, which is about taking control of certain aspects of your life. And I, I see no reason to cede all of that cultural ground to, to conservatives when we can come up with a, a, a story of our own. And why do why do you think that the left have been so averse to uh, appropriating this idea on their own behalf? Is it is it just out with much of the left's experience, or is it just ideologically uh, um, problematic? Why, why do you think we we've not attempted to? Because that would be, as you describe elsewhere, that would be a, it would be a matter of seizing ground that would be actually quite useful to the left if we could reshape yeah. that and reframe it for our own purposes. Exactly. And, you know, the left has no problem with it when they're appealing to individual workers to join a union yeah. or to participate in industrial action or to take to the streets and campaigns and, and protests and environmentalism. You name it. You know, there will be appeals made to individuals to, to nominate themselves, to partake in particular responsibilities, to be absorbed or ingested into a collective. And at the end of the day, all of this is value. All of this is very important. Collectivism, I think, at the end is where it ultimately will always land. But every, every seeming collective act begins with a bunch of individuals make it, making a choice there is an individual act of self-will that places a person into a collective. And so all I'm saying is that you can contextualise the systemic issues and the role the individual might have in bettering or worsening their circumstances within that without absolving the system of yeah. responsibility. And and so I think the, the, the problem I had is that I got myself into this problem with the first book, which was never written to be read by 140,000 people or whatever the sales for it are now. It was it was written, it was a local book that was designed to be read by local people. And so I didn't feel that I had to second guess myself. I was imagining that I was writing a book for people who already knew me, who already knew my politics. And ultimately what happened was the book ended up doing much better than any of us would ever dare to imagine. And I hadn't laid out all the context of my thinking and clarified it in the usual way that you might if you were talking to a new audience. And so the book ended up resonating a lot with people all over the political spectrum. And I think that's why some people in Scotland on the left also saw some kind of red flag because these ideas were reaching beyond our kind of ideological conclave. And that was apparently evidence of me being... Um, drawn into some other kind of reactionary thinking, but that's definitely not the case. And do you think, Dan, it's interesting you say that it, it resonated across the spectrum. Do you think some people on the right have interpreted it willfully as they like to uh, interpret it? Oh, absolutely. And this was, this was, uh, this was partly because people on the right they're more tolerant to different ideas because they themselves are used to being criticised so heavily for things. So the, the, this and this kind of almost sort of endows them with a higher level of tolerance because they need a higher level of tolerance for their ideas to be accepted. You will find that people on the right, for example, are more likely to attend events by left-wing figures, intellectuals, activists, just because they want to hear what they've got to say because there's something about their personality or their politics that's more open to hear these ideas that isn't so viscerally challenged by the fact that these ideas that exist and are being discussed. On the left, there is an informal social pressure not to associate in any way with anyone who has any ideas that don't reside on the left and that that's evidence of some kind of betrayal. And with the second book, my chapter on the left, it was an attempt to clarify a lot of my thinking um, from Poverty Safari. And I think basically the style of the second book was to to let everybody know what my politics are. You know, I would say that the, the second book is far more an, a creature of the left than, than the first one. Um, so it, it was just to say to the audience, look, you might, you might think I'm some sort of closet Tory because I was talking about personal responsibility. So let's just let's just straighten that out. Um, but of course, I, ultimately, mate, 
I can't control what other people think of my work. I have to write about it from the perspective that I see it. And all my stuff is out on the ground reporting. All my stuff is researched pretty fucking diligently. And so when people are picking holes in it, um, a lot of the, the arguments that I see against it, um, they're, they're, they're more opinion driven. Um, I, know, I very rarely have seen a challenge come in that's based on this assertion that you made, this evidence that you've cited, Da, 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 wrong yeah. and so you know you have to allow for a certain amount of subjectivity with all of these things do you, do you think is there anything psychologically on the left uh, we, we're obviously in a minority we're kind of marginalized does that contribute to a, a an aversion to adopt and, and be new ideas be more flexible and are thinking that because we're desperately trying to hold on to whatever position we've got whereas the right are kind of in control, they've got power, they can maybe afford the luxury of more flexible thinking. Yeah, it's well, you know, there's a fine line between flexible thinking and adopting any position you can because you have no core principles, unless yeah. the core principle simply is the the um, acquisition of power. And I guess there is a, a logical argument that follows from this, and you'll hear that a lot from the right of the Labour Party. The right of the Labour Party will talk a lot about gesture politics this is them giving a nod to corbyn who actually has been right on a lot of issues as time has passed since he was uh, evicted from the labor party um and 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 uh, but irrespective of that what what they see is um achieving power as a core principle isn't actually evidence of a moral vacuum it's evidence of pure purely practical thinking and this is an argument that i do have a certain level of sympathy for despite the fact that ultimately what it leads to is the kind of nightmare the Labour Party is in now, where it's so scared of an anti-Semitism charge that its leaders documented on television advocating war crimes against yeah. the most oppressed population uh, on the face of the air. So uh, that's the problem with that. Now, in terms of new ideas on the left, all of these ideas that, that people usually refer to as identity politics, right? Postmodern concepts, post-structural thinking. These are the new ideas that most people attribute to the left. But actually, yeah. when I'm talking about the left, I don't talk about that stuff. I see that as more indicative of middle class, highly educated um, uh, subsets of people who are kind of on the left, but they display all the mannerisms and confidence of centrists. Confidence in their assertions, confidence to assert their needs, confidence to make demands upon society for what they require. And and that confidence is usually indicative of being raised in a social class where you rightly have a sense of entitlement to demand these things. The left that I talk about, or what I mean by the left, is the radical left. The radical left, which is about downward distribution of wealth, which is about public ownership of infrastructure and utilities, which is about um, trying to cultivate more direct forms of democracy, whether that's through trade unions, whether that's through democratic reforms. The, the good thing about the radical left is that the core ideas, the core ideas that some people would attribute to Marx, these are solid ideas. That's a solid yeah. analysis of an economy, yeah. and that's a solid way to leverage the powerful. So they don't really need new ideas in that regard because some of the old tricks still work. Darren, I, w I wonder if uh, the, the, the shift towards identity politics for some on the left is, as you allude to, that a lot of, from a lot of middle-class people who identify on the left, class politics is kind of settled for them. They're doing OK out of the system. So one way uh, to... Uh, I guess, retain a, a veneer of radicalism is on the basis of identity politics. Well, one of the, the real pleasures of reading your work, not, not just the your poverty safari and the social distance, but also your, your poetry uh, and your, your broadcasting and, and columns and so on, is just your, your love of the English language. Oh, There's a you. real embrace uh, and a real eloquence in it. And it's even if I don't agree with everything you're saying all the time, I, I really love the way you're saying it a lot of the time. Um, you mentioned, and particularly in your, your BBC show, uh, you mentioned, uh, you describe language as not only a measure of class, but a measure of class power as well. Can you, can you describe how 
how how language and, and idioms and, and and accents and all the rest of it, Darren. How how you've is it still as you do you still experience it in the same way? When I first published Poverty Safari, I was travelling to London every few weeks to take meetings with executives um, about television work, broadcasting work, and they always came to nothing. And I didn't really understand why. It didn't bother me. I was so busy anyway. It was a blessing that um, that my profile wasn't elevated to that intolerable level that uh, that that um, having a show on network television can bring if it goes well. But I caught the chain. I caught the tail end of an email chain between my agent and an executive up here, and basically the issue was my accent. You know, the issue was the accent. They were worried that they would have to subtitle me. And this hurt me. You know, this hurt me. And then that, that sort of launched me into thinking more about language. And, and the sequence that you talk about at Class Wars, where we make reference to language and we talk to a sociolinguist and we get all of the scientific underpinning of the development of vocabulary and vocal anatomy and all of this, then... Um, uh, that that really came from the early draft of the book. So a lot of the stuff you see in Class Wars was already ideas I was writing about in the book, although the book wouldn't come out for a couple of years after that. And it was really because what I was experiencing was even though I had had this rubber stamp and this prestige of becoming, you know, a prize winning author and someone who was regarded as successful in inverted commas, I still faced this prejudice. The only thing to my advantage was that there were so many opportunities available to me that I could just pivot to something else and also that I had an awareness that this prejudice exists and what and, and a choice on whether to modulate my speech style to accommodate it. The, 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 the point I try to make about language is the majority of people out there, they don't have that understanding. They, they, they just have an internalised sense of inferiority, of low self-esteem whenever they find themselves in a dynamic where they are trying to communicate to someone that they intuitively sense is of a higher social class. And so um, really I wanted to kind of un uh, uh, unveil the uh, mechanics of that, the quantum mechanics of that, and really make the argument that uh, accent prejudice is one of the subtlest forms of prejudice um, in many cases, but that it has a compounding effect on many of the other inequalities that we see around class, race, sexuality, and all of the other all of the other things. And 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 ultimately, um, it's only been this year where I have now been working on network television. And there's no surprise why this pro production is stretching on much much longer than any of the other productions. And that's because we have more cooks at the table, more opinions and more anxiety about me. How will I be presented? How will I be received? How do we make it make sense for yeah. people in Middle England watching BBC Two while a working class Scottish person is using big words like gesticulate on television but is not livid with anger? Um, and that, that's for some reason is the kind of minutia that really preoccupies a lot of executives and you you really have to if you want the opportunity you've got to kind of decide um whether you're going to dig your heels in at every single p potential conflict or whether you're going to you know allow some shit to be shoved with on you for the for the benefit of a of a broader goal but it's a massive challenge mate yeah, yeah i don't know if you've seen because i know a uh, again i share a love of hip hop uh, with you, Darren, I don't know if you've seen a documentary, The Great Hip Hop Hoax. A couple of white boys from, from up north who are trying to um, get a recording deal. They're serious about their, their music. Every time they try and get a gig, they're turned away. People don't take their accent seriously. And one day, just almost on a whim, they feign an American accent and suddenly contracts and gigs and tours and all the rest of it are getting thrown at them. Have you ever found a... a unwittingly or even unconsciously, have you found yourself modulating your accent in order to accommodate others and, and to, uh, to I guess, allay the fears and prejudices that you know you're going to come across? I would never, I would never modulate to the extent that it compromised the integrity of, of who and what I am. 
Yeah. There is a skill in communicating with an awareness of who you're speaking to. And this is something that I developed at a very young age. And so the skill set has just been more sophisticated as I have experienced more variety of social and cultural dynamics. The accent will put someone off to the extent that they're not even paying attention to what's being said. And my, my friend says, he remarked to me, he says, it's, it's no surprise that the first time you actually started writing in the Queen's English, you won the Orwell Prize. Yeah. And what he's saying is, there's no difference in the quality of my writing, whether I'm writing music or whether it's it's in a, in a kind of more literary format. But what is different is the level of uh, acceptance that's out there, the level of yeah. tolerance that's out there. Um, but actually, and also if you look at uh, the, the Cillabone Brains, great guys, very talented MCs, very talented musicians. Yeah. And I know James McAvoy has just had a film commissioned uh, where he's going to tell the story okay. of these guys. Now, I don't know anything about that film, but I hope it's about accent prejudice. I hope that's yeah. the real takeaway from it. Because if it is about that, then I can get behind it. If it becomes this thing where it's portraying these two guys as the only people that have ever tried to rap in a Scottish accent, then I won't just be non-supportive of it. I'll be actively going after it. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure James knows what he's doing, and I'm pretty sure that it'll be inspired by his experiences in the acting world of someone who comes from a certain background and speaks a certain way, and all of those challenges that come with that. And it's a clever way for him to indirectly touch on those issues. Yeah. But yeah, there are artists up here in the hip hop community and have been since the '80s who are just as talented as any other artists around the world. But for some reason, none of us have been able to make a leap into commercial success. Um, and that's partly because there's no music industry support because it's it's regarded as a kind of obscure cultural um, cultural phenomenon. Yeah. Just last question, Darren. I, again, I was rereading uh, parts of uh, The Social Distance yesterday in preparation for today. And you talk about the... A couple of things. One, the the, the paternalism, as you see it, uh, of the liberal left and maybe even parts of the self-defining left. Yeah. Uh, and you also talk about, I guess, which is maybe a, a part of the flip side of that, you talk about the ideological fixity uh, and uh, rigidity uh, of the left. Is this same... Do you, do you look at the left with, with our maladies and do you still have hope? Do you still think that's a left that if it can learn, if it can evolve, it is equipped to be the authors of the kind of change that we were looking for? Uh, where I stand on this is, see when it comes to that Das Kapital Communist Manifesto TripAdvisor review of capitalism, which is ultimately what these books are most of the time, it still stands up. It's still yeah. a really detailed, articulate, objective analysis of the fundamental character of capitalism, particularly as it begins to reach those end stages. And so as an analysis, I believe that you could go and pick any of that literature up, read it, and you will be better informed as to the basic dynamics of the structure in which you live. But as a political manifesto for how to organise a society, it's obviously outdated now, right? It's obviously outdated, apart from the kind of core themes of collectivism, public ownership, um, and a society which aspires to be about more than just gross domestic product. Um, and and um, enrichment of the individual. But there will come a time <clears throat> where I think, and we're getting closer to that time, not in our lifetimes, but I mean, you know, in, in broader historical terms, we're getting closer to a point where you can even see politicians like Gordon Brown using the term neoliberalism. That used to be frowned upon. People used to think neoliberalism was some kind of left-wing hokum. 
you know what I mean? And it was just a bogeyman. So when somebody like Gordon Brown, who is a kind of, you know, whether you like him or not, he's regarded as a, 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 a politician um, with an economic mind, you know what I mean? And he's written books about the economy and participated quite heavily in dealing with the aftermath of the financial crisis. When they begin using that language, then that tells you there is something in that, that we are living in a particular ideological time frame economically. And the only solution to that, apart from that we have to avoid ecological collapse and all of the political turmoil that comes with that, is that there has to be an answer to the hoarding of wealth and resources, the destruction of the natural environment, the proliferation of mental illness, and all of the different signifiers that something is fundamentally wrong and that that answer will have to come in some form uh, in the shape of putting a limit on how much a person can earn, how much a person can extract from the world in the labour market because the more money that person has, the more leverage they have over the democratic structures and that can't be fair. What that looks like in the 21st century of artificial intelligence and big data and tech oligarchs, I'm not sure. Whether that comes as a result of political pressure from the people or whether that comes in the face of some global catastrophe from which humanity has to, to relearn how to organise itself, I'm not sure. I tend to veer on the latter as the outcome because there is a particular defect of humans which is we are not evolved to foresee long-term threats. We are not really evolved. We can't even plan our own diet so we can advance. You know, we are always living in the moment according to impulse. And this is reflected in a lot of the political discourse and political choices that, that are made. So we are afflicted by short-termism because we were never designed to think about things in longer terms. But ultimately, I do think that, that, that we will see uh, a society that's fundamentally fairer, a society that's about living in harmony with the natural world, and it's a society where we utilise and marshal technological innovation in pursuit of human well-being and recognition that that is how you produce more stuff, that is how you get society organised, that is how you, you, you create harmony, and ultimately, even for a capitalist, you would think that... Um, a, a workforce that was happy to go to work, that felt a sense of connection with the, what it was producing, whether they be goods or services, it would be of a lot more use and a lot more efficiency than uh, an absolutely battered and bruised, demoralised workforce suffering from every form of malady that you can currently imagine. Who knows, though, it's an interesting time to be alive, unless you're Palestinian, of course. Yes, indeed. Uh, and listen, um Every project needs its uh, turbulent priests. Uh, and I, I don't know if you'll take it as a compliment, Dan, but I, I, I genuinely see you and, and voices like yours as, as assets to the left. We, we need people within the, um, the conversation to be asking difficult questions and be t to be challenging uh, and to interrogate where we are. Because as you say, unless we can impress our ideas on uh, the people we need to impress them on, the, the, the alternatives don't look very nice uh, going into the future. So listen, Dan, thank you so much uh, for your time. Really appreciate it. And good luck with uh, your future uh, endeavours. Um, I look forward to, to watching and reading them. Take care thank of yourself. Thank you. Great, Dan. Enjoyed being with you. Thanks, Mike. Me too. Take care, Dan. See you later, man. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Dan McGarvey, uh, an interrogative and vital voice on the left. Uh, I hope you um, enjoyed his chat. He Reminded me of C.W. Mills' comments on the need to step outside our private orbits and to set our private troubles, as he described them, against the wider canvas of public issues. In other words, to contextualise our most intimate experiences against the historical and structural background. And I wonder if that's the act of will that Darren is encouraging us to see as an act of personal responsibility. I was also taken by his criticisms of that liberal left who he accuses of lapsing into identity politics to at the cost of a class analysis. It's not the left that I've been 
active alongside, although of course I, I, I bumped into uh, such people uh, over the years. Um, it's not Red Lines TV, that's for sure, although we have reflected, of course, on the politics of, of race and sexuality and gender. Those are critical elements to our struggle. I guess the question is how do we incorporate them into a wider class analysis? Um, I'm glad you tuned in, comrades. I hope you enjoyed the show. Darren McGarvey, as I say, is, is a vital voice in these bleak times with people questioning um, without navel-gazing, of course, our analysis. Uh, all the best to equip ourselves for these dangerous times. If you can subscribe to Redlines TV, please do. If you can uh, donate, even better. Uh, but until next time, thank you for tuning in and solidarity, everyone.